So let's get started. Today we are going to talk about the groundwater. Last time we have discussed the running water. So today we are going to talk about new topic which is groundwater. So when we say groundwater, the first thing came to our mind is we have a water buried inside the earth, right? So the, the other question what, which is reasonable, how I'm going to find water and if I have soil inside the earth. So the answer is the water is going to be stored inside the soil or the, or the fresher uh, rocks. So when we say groundwater, that means we have water inside the earth and it's stored or it's found in the pores of soil and sediment plus narrow fractures in the bedrock. So as you can see in this picture, you can see a water inside the soil and sediments. So we know that inside the soil or the sediments, we have like a porous, we call this one porous. If we have a water, the water will try to fill that porous inside the soil and the fracture rocks. If you don't have water, then the void is to, it will be filled with, with air. Okay, so if we have groundwater, that means the uh, soil is completely filled the porous of the soil is completely filled with water. And if that is the case, we will call the region which uh, all the pores are completely filled with the water, we will call it saturated zone. Okay, so we call this saturated zone because the pores are filled with, with water. And the upper zone we call this unsaturated zone which means that the pores are not filled with water probably is going to be filled with air and the line between the saturated zone and unsaturated zone we call this line water table so the water table is the upper limit for the saturated zone so again Groundwater is water found in the pores of soil and sediment, plus narrow fracture in the bedrock. You can see here the pores inside the soil, which is filled with water. And here you can see the fracture rock also filled with, with water. We know that groundwater is one of the most important uh, sources for fresh water. And last time, we discussed the distribution of the fresh water. So if, the, if that cube here represent the total volume of fresh water, we will find that the ice sheets and glaciers represent 68%, which is the largest portion. And unfortunately, the water inside the uh, ice sheets and glaciers are inaccessible, which means that it's very difficult to obtain that water. The groundwater, on the other hand, is liquid fresh water. So mainly we are going to use the groundwater for many purposes. And if we are going to talk only about the liquid fresh water, so if this uh, cube here represent only the liquid fresh water, not the total volume of fresh water, only the liquid fresh water, we are going to find that the ground water represents about 96% of all the liquid fresh water. The rest, which is a 4%, represent the water inside the soil moisture, water vapor in the atmo uh, atmosphere, and water in the rivers. So all, all of these them combined together represent only 4% of the liquid fresh water, while the ground water represent 96%. So 
So it's fair to say that groundwater is the largest reservoir of fresh water that is readily available for human. So in term of geological importance, the groundwater is also very important because it acts like erosional agent. We know that the groundwater, when the groundwater mix with carbon dioxide, they will react with each other and they will produce carbonic acid. And we know that the carbonic acid is going to dissolve some rocks like the limestone. So the limestone can be easily dissolved by the uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide, by the uh, carbonic acid. And as a result, we are going to have caves like this one, or you can have sinkholes like this one, because the groundwater is working as a regional agent. It will uh, dissolve some kind of rocks or soluble rocks, such as limestone. Another important feature for the groundwater, the groundwater work as uh, equalizer for upstream flow, which means that if this one is the groundwater, and here we are, and here we have a stream or a river. So we know that in dry periods, the level uh, of the uh, river or the stream is going to be reduced. In that case, the groundwater will try to feed the uh, stream with water again. So the groundwater is just like a storage that sustain streams during dry periods. So in geological point of view, groundwater is an original agent and it's equalizer of stream flow, which means that in dry periods, the groundwater will try to uh, recharge the stream again with water. So up to that point, any questions about the groundwater? Okay, if you don't have any questions, I will move to another point. Also, we are going to talk about the distribution of ground water. So, from where we can get the uh, uh, water uh, for the groundwater. So, most groundwater soaks into the ground from the precipitation. Remember the precipitation from the hydrologic cycle. So, through the precipitation, we are going to have or we are going to recharge the ground water with water. And we are going to see many zones. The first one is zone of soil moisture. So if you can see at that picture here, the first zone here, which is very close to the surface, we call this soil moisture. And when we say that the soil moisture, that means it's a zone where we have water in that zone, but the water is held by something called molecular attraction on soil particles. So the, the, the particles attract with, with each other in order to hold the water uh, within that region. And that water is very important for the plants. The plants is going to use that water in order to uh, feed itself. Also, that water it could be eva evaporated back to, to the at atmosphere. So any water inside the zone of soil moisture, either to be used by plants or evaporate again to the atmosphere. Then what will happen if the water is not stored inside the soil moisture. 
if this is the case, the water it will infiltrate uh, further downward or uh, percolates further downward. So now we discuss the soil moisture. We are going to discuss another zone, which is a zone of saturation. The lower uh, lowest part here is a zone of saturation. So in that zone, all the pores or, or the pores are completely filled with water. So if you take a small sample here, uh, you are going to look inside the soil. We can see that all the pores or the spaces are completely filled with water. And if that's the case, we are going to call this zone, we are going to call it the zone of saturation. So the zone of saturation is a zone where all the pore spaces are completely filled with water. Also, the upper part here, the line here, we call this line water table. Water table represents the upper limit of the zone of saturation. Also, <coughs> above that zone, we'll have something called capillary fringe. Here we have fluctuation of the level of the water. We call this capillary uh, fringe zone. And finally, we have the unsaturated zone. So the area above the zone of saturation is called unsaturated zone. And we call it that because if, we, if you take a sample here, you are going to magnify the sample, you are going to find that the pores are not completely filled with water. Actually, we're going to find air and a little bit water inside the pores of the soil. And the uh, unsaturated zone includes the soil moisture and also includes the capillary fringe. In other words, any region above or any area above the zone of saturation is unsaturated zone. And that includes soil moisture and capillary fringe. Also, we are going to have variation in the water table. Again, that line here, which represents the upper limit of the zone of saturation, is the water table. And that line is not constant. It varies with many factors. Okay, So the depth is highly variable, the depth of the water table. It varies from year to year, from season to season. For example, in the summer or in dry periods, the water table level is going to be as low as possible, while in other seasons where you have heavy precipitation, the water level is going to be as high as possible. We need to know that precipitation variation affect the depths of the water table because if you do remember in the first lecture, in the first slide, we say that uh, the recharge process of the groundwater is going to take place by the precipitation. So any questions so far about the zones of the groundwater, the zone of saturation, the unsaturated zone, the capillary fringe, or the water table, or the soil moisture? Uh, let's move on to another point. So, also, it's very important to monitor the water table. Remember, also with the running water, we have devices in order to monitor the uh, running water. And again, we are going to monitor the water table. So, do you remember why we are going to do that? So we are going to do that in order to manage our water. So it's a process of water management. And the groundwater is a valuable source for, uh, for water. 
So we need to monitor the water table. So in order to do that, we need to have a network of wells. So if you can see here in, the, in that state in, the, in America, we have a number of wells. So if we take that well here in particular, we are going to have a well with float. So the floats show us the level of the water table. And the float is connected with other device, help us to know the, the level of the water table. And again, it's connected with antenna in order to uh, transmit the information, which means that we can access the data remotely. And as you can see here, we have a numbers of wells in order to monitor the water table inside a certain area. And in this graph, we have the season in the x-axis, and here we have the level of the water table in y-axis. As you can see here, the level of the water table varies with the with the, with the year or with the seasons. For example, between May and November, we have decrease in the level of the water table, mainly because in that period, the groundwater will try to recharge the streams. It's going to feed the streams. And if the groundwater will try to feed the stream, we are going to have a drop in the level of the water table. While from November to March here, we are going to see increase in the water table, mainly because we have precipitation. So when we have precipitation, we are going to have uh, a rise in the level of water table. During the dry periods, we are going to have a decrease in the uh, level of the water table because we said that during dry periods the groundwater will try to feed or try to supply these streams with water. So we now we have connection, we have interaction between groundwater and we have interaction between the groundwater and the streams. You can see in the picture here, here we have the water table. When the level of the water table is higher than the uh, stream service, in that case, the groundwater will supply the stream with water. When the water table level is higher than the stream service, in that case, the groundwater will try to feed or supply the uh, stream with water. On the other hand, if the uh, water table level is lower than the stream service, in that case, the stream will try to feed the ground water, will try to feed or supply the ground water. And also here, we are going to have the same case here, the uh, water table le level is less than the stream service. In that case, the stream is going to feed the ground water with water. The difference between uh, picture B or the figure B and the figure C, here we have connection. Still, we have connection between the ground water and the stream, while here we don't have any connection. So the water will infiltrate for a distance in order to reach the saturation zone. So the interaction between ground, water, and stream, we could have gaining for the stream, gaining, of course, of water, in case the water table is higher than the stream surface. Or the stream could lose water in the case of the water table is lower than the stream surface. Sometimes we have combinations. A stream can gain some uh, some water in some sections, while while lose uh, some waters in others. Okay, so here is the we can see 
a connection between running water and ground water. Any questions regarding that point? How to monitor the water table and how uh, the, the connection or the interaction between the ground water and the streams? Okay, let's move on. Now we want to talk about the factors influencing the storage and the movement of groundwater. In other words, we want to know how much the soil is going to store water and we want to know also how much the water is going to move inside the soil. So in order to know this, we need to understand the first factors. The first factor is the porosity. When we say porosity, it means that how much the water can, how much the soil can store water. And to understand this, we need to look at that figure here. So here in that uh, baker, we have sediments of 1000 milliliters. Here we have another baker with also 1,000 milliliter of water. Now, try to fill uh, the first baker here with the, with the water from the second baker. Assume that when you are pouring the water from here to here, assume that 500 milliliter stored inside the first beaker here. What does it mean? It means that 50% of the volume, 50% of the uh, pore spaces has been filled with, with water. If you put half of the uh, water inside the beaker here and the, uh, the first beaker managed to store that water, it means that pore spaces represent 50% of the volume of the sediments. Okay, so we can see that the soil here, it has ability to store water. So why, why some soil can store more than the other? So it depends on the size and the shape of the grains. So if you have a bigger sizes, or smaller sizes, or the shape itself, this is going to affect the capacity of the sediments to store water. Also, how well they are sorted, and how tightly they are packed. So all of these are factors affecting the porosity. So porosity determines how much groundwater can be stored. OK? So, any question regarding the porosity? The porosity factor. Okay, let's move on to talk about another factor, which is permeability. We said that water, uh, ground, uh, the soil can store water, and also water can move through the soil. And that movement, the ability of the material to transmit fluid, the ability of the soil itself to transmit the water, we call this permeability. And mainly it depends on the connectivity between the pores of the soil. So if the soil it has good permeability, that means the water it can move from this point to that point quickly. If the water or if the soil it has low permeability, it means that the water is going to move slowly, or in some cases, the water it cannot move at all. So the permeability, we have what's so-called aquatert. When you have aquatert, it means that you have impermeable layer, which means that the layer, it has very low permeability. If you can look at that figure here, we will say that this layer, uh, is, it has high permeability. 
which means that the water can move freely in that zone. Here we have a quarter. When we have a quarter, that means the water cannot move freely in that zone. And the water is going to be prevented from, from moving from that area to that area because this one is a quarter. So when we say a quarter, it means that I have impermeable layer that hinders or prevent water movement, like the clay. If you have the clay, then the movement of the water is going to be very difficult. On the other hand, we have aquifer. The aquifer, it's opposite to the, uh, to the aquifer. It means that I have permeable rock structure or sediments that transmit groundwater freely, like the sands and the gravel. So if you want to try this by yourself, try to, try to have a tube filled with clay and another tube filled with sand and gravel. And try to put water on the top of the tube. Okay, so you have a tube. In the middle of the tube, a tube number one, put clay. In tube number two, put sand or gravel. Then put water inside the upper part of the tube, tube one and tube two. And then look at the bottom of the tube for tube number one and tube number two. So tube number one, it contains clay. Tube number two, it contains sands or gravel. Then if you are look from, uh, from, from the bottom of the tube, then you will notice what? Anyone can guess uh, what you can notice? The water and the clay tube uh, won't go through. Will not go through or you are going to find only small amount of water. Yes. What about the tube number two? It will be filled with water, like almost filled with water. You are going to find that you have leakage of water. You'll, you are going to see a large amount of water going through tube number two, which contains sand and gravel. And we call this property or this factor is permeability. Okay. Also, when you are going to study soil mechanics, one of the experiment that you are going to have, you are going to measure the permeability factor. Okay, so remember we have the porosity, is the ability of soil to store water, and we have the permeability, the ability of soil to transmit water. And we need to know that groundwater moves very slowly. If you are going to talk about average rate, it's like four centimeters per day. So it's very, very slow. And the gravity, the force of gravity and the pressure differences is going to control the movement of the groundwater. So if you can't see here, here we can see the lines which represent the movement of groundwater. So we are going to have the discharge area, and we are going to have recharge area. In the recharge area, we are going to recharge the groundwater with, with water. While on the, in the discharge area, the groundwater will try to feed the stream. So in that region, we are going to gain water, and here I'm going to lose water. So the groundwater is replenished replenish in the recharge area. So it's going to be renewed here in the uh, recharge area. And the groundwater flow back to the surface in discharge area in order to feed the stream. And in that region, I have high gravity force the water to go inside uh, the, the, the soil. While here, we have a high pressure or the, 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 is the pressure is going to move the soil in order to feed the uh, stream with water. So the force of gravity and the pressure differences is going to control the movement of the groundwater. We have area of recharge 
and we have area of discharge. In the area of recharge, we are going to gain water for the groundwater, and the area in dis discharge, we are going to lose water from the groundwater. Any questions so far regarding the how the groundwater moves inside?